Hello, Paper and Glam readers, and happy Halloween. Today we have our Glamoween installment of Book Club, and we're going to be discussing our October selection, Practical Magic. Before we get started with Practical Magic discussion, though, we have our annual Paper and Glam Book Club 2020 teaser. So each of the book chatters are going to pick a book from our 2020 lineup and say why they are most excited to read that title in 2020. So I'm going to skip because I am excited to read all of the books and I'm a little biased about that and pass it to Erica. Erica, what book are you most excited to read together in 2020? Well, there are some on there that I have already read and I'm excited to reread them. But the one that I am looking forward to reading that I haven't read is Campaign Widows by Amy. I probably am saying her last name wrong. Agresti, I think maybe is how you say it. Um, it's been on my like to read list since somebody said that they liked it when it first came out and I just haven't picked it up yet. So that's the one that I'm looking forward to. I'm just going to jump in and give a little dialogue. Um, sorry to catch you up, Leslie. So Campaign Widows, we have an election coming up in November, as I'm sure has not escaped no one. And um, I thought that it would be really fun to read a contemporary fiction book about an election and about kind of the behind the scenes of an election and what it's like from a, um, a potential candidate's spouse's perspective and it has great reviews and I'm really excited to hear that Erica that was already on your radar. I actually picked it up at a bookstore um, in Napa when I was home for Christmas last year and I was like oh the perfect seasonal read for November. I was thinking I wanted to get something um, you know kind of Americana but uh, wanted something really light. So anyway I'm excited that that was already on your radar Erica. Uh, Leslie how about you? Um, probably no surprise, but it is The Testaments by Margaret Atwood. I did pre-order that book, and then once I found out that it was going to be on the list, I'm just like patiently waiting to read it. Um, totally my genre, and I read The Handmaid's Tale a couple years ago and absolutely loved it, so I can't wait to see what happens. I'm going to just keep jumping in. <laughs> Um, I'm so excited about this, and I've been having these under my hat for like a year. So um, we usually don't do sequels with the Paper and Glam Book Club, just because, you know, I don't want to assume anyone's read the first one. But this is similar to like when Ghost Had a Watchman came out, and it's, you know, this is a literary event, and I didn't want to miss discussing it in, you know, our community. And also, I read about half The Handmaid's Tale a couple years ago when the series was just coming out, and I couldn't help but think, this would be so good to discuss in book club. This would be so good to discuss in book club. I bought it when Claire Danes um, did the audio for it. So that was announced and I just grabbed it because I've been always wanted to read it. It's like the original dystopian book. It's so relevant for where we're at today. But yeah, I just couldn't, I like, I like couldn't do it without you guys. It just was not complete. So I'm really excited to read that and then read the, the testaments and then finally discuss them together and kind of get everyone's take on this literary event. All right, Desiree, how about you? I'm also a little bit biased. I'm excited to read the autobi autobiography of Santa Claus with you guys. Um, I suggested it last year. I actually found it through um, another YouTuber, Christopher Allen. Um, and I was like, this is perfect for papering way of book club. I need to share with everyone. So I'm really happy that I made the cut and I made the list. And I'm really excited to see what you guys think about it. Well, that makes me so happy. So the autobiography of Santa Claus was a Desiree Riviera pick. She's famous. And when she sent it to me, I, it was already on my radar. And then when I was, so what happened was, so for Christmas real quick, I was going home for Christmas and I forgot by the door my big stack of books that I wanted to take home to read over Christmas. So I was so devastated and I was like, no, because it's like my read under the Christmas tree for 10 days time. So I went to my local bookstore and I saw it, it was like in the window, like in the display and it had, they had the cute little display with all the, it's actually a trilogy. So they had like all of the trilogy displayed and I was like, oh my gosh, it's meant to be, this has to be the December selection. Cause Maureen had also selected a really great one that I think we'll read next year. Um, but I, so I was kind of going back and forth between both of those. And I saw that big display. I was like, okay, this is it. So thank you, Desiree, for suggesting that title. We have quite a few actually member titles of uh, Paper and Glam community member titles on the, on the list this year. And I'm always, always open to what you guys want to read because you are my favorite readers. All right, Jaina. I'm really excited about reading Glitter. I just think it sounds really interesting. And I hadn't really heard about it before. 
but when Lisa Marie suggested it, I went and like Googled it and looked it up and I just thought it sounded like a really fun, atmospheric kind of um, different story. Yeah, so glitter, this is one that is hard to find if you just search glitter because a million things come up um, in Amazon. So glitter is about a, uh, it's basically inside Versailles, which I'm obsessed with Versailles. If you guys have seen the show Versailles or if you haven't seen it, I highly suggest you go watch it now, especially if you are anticipating the crown's return because it's basically like the French crown. It's super high production value, actually filmed at Versailles, like super insane. So I'm obsessed with Versailles. And when I saw this book on that same shopping trip, I was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. It's young adult. And I have a little bit of a, young adult is not my genre unless Jenny Han writes it. So as you guys know, I tend to I tend to pick Jenny <laughs> um, and I don't want to get any flack for that this year. Um, <laughs> so I saw that and the, the cover is beautiful. And I was like, this is so fun. Like, so it's actually 17th century in the castle still, but the rest of the world is modern day. And it's like all kind of like the scandals and how that all plays out. And it did really well. So there's also a sequel. So that's always nice because there's like money in the bank. If you end up loving it, you can go see what finds out. Uh, see what happens in the sequel, which is Shattered. I think that's by April Lynn Pike. All right, Miss D. Okay, so I already um, read this book um, this summer because I got an advanced reader copy of it um, from work, but I'm excited to reread it and I'm excited for everyone to read it. It's American Worlds by um, Catherine McGee. Yeah, Catherine McGee. Okay, sorry. So yeah, it was really good. Um, great YA, very juicy, gave me the Gossip Girl vibes. And if you know me, I am a Gossip Girl queen, like loved the books, loved the show, love everything. So definitely excited to reread this one and for everyone to read it. Okay, I'm really excited about this. This was the last edition. I had something else for July, and I might still use it, so I'm not going to spoil it. Um, but I was so excited about this book. I went to see the Downton Abbey premiere, and there's a brand new bookstore. It's an Amazon books, but I was like, okay, I just want to check it out. And I always get a souvenir when I go somewhere new, and I hadn't been to this area in LA. So I saw the cover, and the cover is gorgeous, and it's so like glamericana y and of course, on like the publisher's copy, it says it has Gossip Girl vibes. And that's like when somebody tells me it has Gatsby vibes, which is basically the same thing. Um, I was like, oh my gosh, I hate when they do that to me because it's catnip and some publisher is doing that. Please, when I publish my book, please give it Gatsby vibes. Um, so anyway, and then Emily told me she was reading it and that just made me so very excited and she loved it. So Emily, I think we might have lost Miss Emily or is, am I crazy? Um, anyway, let's see. Or is Zoom just doing something weird? Zoom is doing something weird. I'm still getting I'm used still to here. it. <laughs> I had to expand my screen. I was like, wait, I'm about to pass it to Emily. <laughs> and she's nowhere to be found. All right. So Emily, which book are you most excited to read in 2020? I, the one I'm most excited, again, is also American Royals. I can't wait to hear what everybody thinks about it. I can't wait to reread it. But to pick one that I haven't read yet, um, I'm excited about One True Loves. I know that people love Taylor Jenkins Reid, and I've never read one of her books, so I'm excited to dive into to one yeah. of them. So Taylor Jenkins Reid has missed the book club list for like five years in a row. Um, and I think I had her on maybe two years ago when for um, The Seven Husbands of Elizabeth Hugo, and I know Desiree, I think you really recommended that one to me, and it was on the list. And um, yeah, for whatever reason, like we had a different March book or whatever, because it has a very Marchy cover, March or December. Um, and then, of course, Daisy Jones and the Six totally blew up. Both The Seven Husbands of Elizabeth Hugo and Daisy Jones are being adapted. One by, I think, Amazon and Reese Witherspoon, and I think the other one's like Freeform. So that's really exciting. Taylor's having quite the year. So I'm excited to have her on. And then back to American Royals with the Gossip Girl vibes. I don't know if you guys heard, but Gossip Girl is getting a reboot and is like in production. So it's a very, very good time to revisit all of those Gossip Girl vibes. So yeah, I hope that gives everybody a good little teaser for um, 2020 year in books. I'm excited to read all your comments. And what book we just mentioned you're most excited to read? Oh, Maureen, I just saw you joined us again. Are you, is your internet okay? Um, yeah, I, can you hear me? Yes. Good, okay, yeah, I moved upstairs and it's fine upstairs. Um, so I'm on a very tiny tablet, um, but 
as long as it's working, that's good. I'm here. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad you can make it. Before I get into the book, do you have a title that you're most excited to read for next year? Yes, Testaments, for sure. The Testament. Okay. Another vote for Testaments. Yeah, that's such a literary event. Like, it couldn't be missed. All right, so let's get into practical magic. So our course first question is, what was your experience reading Practical Magic and how many witches would you rate it? So I have to confess, I did not get to this book this month. I've never not read the selection in the five years we've been running book club, but I have just been bananas crazy. Just all the things, all the things. We launched like a brand new shop today and just, oh, you know, tis the season. So please forgive me for missing this month's read. I did read The Rules of Magic because my my in-person book club is reading the rules of magic like earlier in the month. So I'm going to have to take a pass and just do a little moderating this month. So Miss Erica, what did you think of Practical Magic? How many witches? Um, I would give it, I don't know, somewhere between four, four and a half, maybe. Um, I have read Alice Hoffman before, but I have only read like her like middle grade young adult stuff. Uh, so I haven't read any of her like general fiction um and I've never seen the movie so I went into this like not really having any idea of what to expect and like I just loved her writing and the characters and it just felt very like like comfy and um like a world that um like I could just get lost in and be happy there um for a long time so I I really enjoyed it and um I and like halfway through the rules of magic and um i i feel pretty much the same about that too but i i'm only halfway through so i don't want to say for sure so i gave it three out of five um i read the rules of magic first and i absolutely fell in love with it and gave that five stars and I wonder if my enjoyment of this book would have been higher had I not read that one first, because I, I just didn't feel as emotionally connected really to any of the characters in Practical Magic. But um, so it was it was just okay for me. But I wonder if I had read it in the order they came out, if it would have been a different experience. I did what Leslie did, and I read Rules of Magic first and then went into Practical Magic. Um, practical Magic, I gave it three and a half witches out of five, but I loved Rules of Magic. I gave it five out of five. Um, and like you said, Leslie, maybe if I didn't read it in that order, I would feel different. Um, and like Erica, I went into both of these, not really um, with any expectation. I'd never watched the movie or really read it Alice Hoffman before. Um, I listened to both Rules of Magic and Practical Magic, um, and the audiobook I found was really short, but really, really good. So Lisa Marie, I highly recommend the audiobook. Um, you'll fly right through it. Um, yeah, I just, I really liked Rules of Magic, and I found that it had more of a story, and a, I don't know, maybe more substance. I'm not really, I'm not really sure if that's the word, um, but yeah, three and a half for Practical Magic. I have a feeling I'm going to be the odd man out. Um, most of the book, I would say, it is a two. It picked up toward the end. So maybe that's cl parts closer to a three. So I'm going to give it a two overall for me. I felt that the writing was really um, stilted and sterile um, from this third person omniscient point of view, which is not always the case with this point of view. But in this instance, that's it really felt like a lot of like telling and not showing. I wish there had been more dialogue and conversation. I know it was a character study rather than a plot based, you know, novel, but I don't always dislike character studies. Um, I, so I just think it was, the way it was written was not for me. And so it may, I started the book very early in the month, like right at the beginning of the month. And I trudged through all the way till today and I read every day, but some days I could not get through very much. And I, I was busy, but I, I mean, it does not typically take me that long to read through a book, but I'm really weird. And if I own the book, I won't do it audiobook because I'm like, well, I own the book. So 
like, why am I gonna go buy an audiobook or rent an audiobook because I have the physical copy? I'm right there with you. I would give it a two and a half, three witches. Um, I just feel like the past two months I've been really struggling reading. And this month I have only read Practical Magic. Um, and it just was really slow for me. Just like um, Jaina, you said, I started at the beginning of the month. And usually I pick do the book club first um, so I can take notes and I'll can fly I'll fly through the book and then I read everything else in my TBR stack, but it just did not happen for me. Um, I could not I clearly since it was the only book I've read, I did not read Practical Magic. I mean not Practical Magic, um The Rules of Magic, sorry. Um yeah, it just was not my um writing style. I just needed a little bit more action. Um, I kind of echo some previous sentiments um, and say I really liked this book. I read uh, Rules of Magic last year and loved it. So I read that one before I read Practical Magic, but I'd seen the movie many times. It's kind of like a Halloween staple along with Hocus Pocus. Um, I loved the movie and I loved Rules of Magic and I was just sort of okay about Practical Magic. Um, I think I gave it like three and a half to four witches. Um, it was diff oh, pretty different from the movie and um, I felt like it was like I as the reader was more disconnected from the characters than I was in reading Rules of Magic. Um, I think a lot of that had to do with like the lack of dialogue or the way it um, spanned a lot of time, like it would just sort of gloss over like two years and we just like missed it. Um, and, but there were, I did like the kind of like witchy vibes. I like the ants, I like the family, I like the way they interact with each other. There were things I definitely liked about it um, that I think I would have, felt differently about maybe if I hadn't read and loved the rules of magic so much than when I read it first. Alrighty. Well, Leslie just reminded me to um, say that the adaptation for the rules of magic is coming out. So I feel like practical magic is also kind of having a moment. I don't know. I actually feel like I like this might be sacrilege. Um, no one unfollow me, but I think I like Practical Magic the movie as much as I like Hocus Pocus. Also, their hair. Like, have you ever noticed their hair in that movie is, like, next level? I mean, it's just so good. Uh, but I feel like it's just, it's, I don't know, maybe it's an L.A. thing. There's all these Practical Magic movie nights happening, like, in different little theaters in L.A. And, yeah, it's just, it's having a moment. It's really fun. All right, so... Ms. Erica, I will address the question to you. Which pair of sisters did you find most relatable? I'm also an only child, so I don't have much of a beat, up, of a beat on the uh, sisters relational or siblings relational type narratives. Um, I was thinking about this at first. My answer was, you know, I liked them um, both pretty equally. Um, but as I started thinking about it more, I think, um, I don't know, there's something about the younger sisters um, that I, maybe it's because they're teenagers, so their emotions in general are going to be more heightened, but I felt like I could get a better read on them um, and like kind of be in their mind better. Um, so I feel like I may be connected with their story a little bit more, but I mean, I liked uh, both the younger and the older sisters. Um, well, really all three of them, the aunts too. Okay, I skipped Maureen, you guys. So sorry. I didn't have her in our little lineup since she was running upstairs. So Maureen, um, tell us what you thought of Practical Magic and then tell us what you thought about the, the sisters, since I think this was your question that you came up with. Yes. Um, hi, sorry. Um, um, so I gave the book uh, Four Witches. I really liked it. I also uh, liked Desiree. I listened to it on Audible and I would recommend that because I feel like what uh, Jaina was saying about the third person narrator, that often is um, off-putting for me, but I think the narrator on the Audible version was 
really great and um, made it, um, uh, I've been struggling with reading and listening in general lately and I really um, just, it was a great story and she was a great storyteller. Um, I chose the middle two sisters. This, uh, yeah, it was my question. I was really fascinated by the, the, um, the parallel, the different generations of sisters, Sally and Jillian were the sisters that I thought were the most relatable. They were sort of reluctant parts in, in um, it was like they were partnered together because who else would understand their problems, um, not because they chose each other. And I thought that was a really realistic depiction of sisters, that the love was there with each other and they often chose to be apart. But when Okay, I think it's my turn. Um, kind of short and simple, like I just didn't really, or is she talking still? That sounded very Halloween-y. <laughs> it was a ghost. <laughs> For is this on? We should start Halloween edition. Okay, I think you're good, Leslie. All right. Um, so yeah, short and simple for me. I really didn't relate to any of the characters in this book. Um, but I will say that in the movie adaptation, I really liked the way they made Franny. She seemed uh, more warm and loving. Or as in the book, she seemed kind of just like cold and hard. So um, I really liked that in the movie aspect of it. But just in general in this book, I just didn't really relate to any of them. Um, so like Lisa Marie and like Leslie, I'm an only child and I couldn't really relate to any of them. Um, the only thing that I think I could relate to is how close everybody was in their family. Um, and, you know, even though they were separated for however long or tried to run away for however long, um, they always went back to their family and to their roots. So, um, yeah, I, that's all I can say on that. So I um I would pick the youngest sisters, Antonia and Kylie. Um, I think just because they're I don't know I think they were better developed overall um, as characters. As I think we saw more time with them, kind of like Emily said, like you would just skip such big gaps. Um, so I feel like with the middle sisters, there was such a big gap skipped and the ants were just kind of um, very tangent tangential. And so we didn't really get to know them, which um, I, I think I'm going to still definitely read Rules of Magic because I feel like I'll get to know them there. And especially because that seems to have better reviews overall. And I know that like, I'm sure Alice Hoffman's writing has developed so much over like an, like a 20 year time span, of course. Um, so I think that the younger ones, I just really like what's going on with them and kind of seeing their growth. And, you know, I, like I don't have sisters, so I don't really like understand like sister relationships. I, I have brothers. Um, but I think that their stories just seem more, I don't know, like feasible uh, because we have more details. Um, so I have one older sister and I didn't really relate to either, um, to any of the sisters, I would say overall, there were certain situations where they were kind of similar, um, like Sally and Jillian, I guess Sally getting Jillian out of trouble, um, my sister and I would keep each other out of trouble and we'd be there for each other. Um, but I did like the youngest sister's relationship overall. Like um, Jaina said, it was more fleshed out. Um, I wish that um, Jillian and Sally were just a little bit more fleshed out. I mean, even though we kind of saw their own childhood a little bit, I would have just liked to have seen a little bit more development in them. I really liked um, Sally and Jillian. Uh, well, I liked all of them, but um, I felt like 
uh, they, the parts of their um, relationship where they just sort of fold right back into each other's lives, even though they had been apart. Um, and they just kind of um, picked up where they left off. Like even if they had been fighting, they could sort of work together or take care of problems or just fit back into each other's lives. Um, I have two sisters. Uh, one of them is my twin sister. Uh, so we are, and both my sisters and I are really close. And I liked that about all of the sisters involved in this story, that they were all like ready to jump into action to take care of each other, even when like the times were tough. They were like, you know, the ants came out when they needed their help and the, you know, Sally was there for Jillian when she needed her and when, and I think that's a real like indication of like a sisterly relationship, just like jumping in when your sister needs you. Um, am I up again? You're up. Oh, okay. Um, did I get cut off earlier? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a little bit, it kept pausing and starting again. Okay, okay, that's what I, I thought, because so did you guys, and then I realized it was me. Um, so um, I don't know if, I, I, I answered this in the earlier round, I'll try again. Um, Sally and Jillian were the sisters I chose, um, because I thought uh, it was really interesting that they were close in childhood, but as adults, they um, were more reluctant partners, and they were partnered together because of their shared history more than by choice. All right, so on to the next question. This is a question from Lit Lovers, and I wanna give them credit. And this is the question I really liked, and Leslie actually also really liked it, so it was perfect. Glam minds think alike. So number three is, how does Hoffman dissolve the boundaries between the inner and outer realms in this novel? Is she, is she suggesting that human passions, when unleashed, can become monstrous threats? So Ms. Leslie, what, what is your opinion here on these boundaries between the magical and the ordinary? Well, I think that um, like inner passions, when it's going against who you are, that that's when the, the monstrous threats come out. So like you have the sisters that leave the house because they wanna live this normal life. And I feel like these threats just kind of follow them and like, no, you can't get away from doing this. Like we're gonna kind of haunt you with that. But you know, if you're following your dreams and your passions and being true to yourself and who you are, that's really kind of when the magic happens in life. And I think once they discovered they couldn't run from everything and they just kind of started facing it, that's when they were able to really kind of get everything back on track and get their lives back together. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize that uh, Desiree's skipping to you. Um, yeah, I like the, the, you know, essentially it's all like a metaphor, um, right? Like the magic or the magical things that are happening are like a metaphor for the way that like we view and um, react to and kind of manifest like things in our lives. Um, I'm thinking particularly with Sally when um, early on when her husband dies and she um, just retreats into herself and she doesn't see color anymore and she never sees orange again right it says and kind of the idea that like that's um nothing is ever the same and so and it's kind of manifest like whether literally she doesn't see color or more of like she can't find the joy that color and life bring um kind of just like being like a sense of your own surroundings um there's just a lot of things and times and instances throughout the text where like the girls imagine something's going to happen and then it does. Um, and it, it, you could call it like a heightened sense of awareness, but kind of their fears manifest and become true almost because they're having them. 
or, you know, and so kind of once they're paying attention to their surroundings, then those things are, are what occur, whether they be positive or negative. And so those emotions have power and um, affect not just themselves, but those around. Um, well, this question, um, I, when I read this question, what stuck out to me the most was the character in the beginning who kept wanting all of these things for um, love, to fall in love with this man. Um, that's where I was I'm going with the question. I felt that um, what Alice Hoffman was trying to say is that if you get everything all at once um, and all of your heart's desires and passions all in one instant, it's not everything um, what it's made out to be. Um, because the guy ended up just getting on her nerves and it was just, and then she wanted to redo everything. So um, it was kind of funny, like the way everyone else answered it was completely uh, different uh, from how I was thinking. So I hope I uh, interpreted it that right. But um, yeah, that's what I um, took away was that if you um, just, if you get everything that you want in life, then it doesn't always um I mean, if you get everything, instant gratification is not always going to pan out perfectly. And um, I think the sisters, once um, they, like, took a breath and, like Jana said, realized their surroundings and they um, kind of would appreciate the struggle, I guess, that they had. I guess you would call it a struggle and deal with their problems. Um, and fight through it, then they got what they wanted in the end. Um, I felt like it wasn't so much that it was a monstrous threat as it was sort of like the difference between good and evil. I think that was a real like standout point in this book that the people can be either you know, passionate and have it be for good or have it be for evil. And I think there were really very clear examples of characters who we were looking at as good and who were, were evil. Um, you know, like Gary and Ben were good characters and you know, the Owen sisters still like felt passionately about them, but they were good and they like brought out goodness in the world where like Jimmy was clearly evil and you know also had that same that same kind of unbridled passion in him as a person and in the people he was interacting with and he was his evilness transcended his death like that there and I think that is more what I took out of the what was like a big threat was the like the passion could be like unchecked passion, I guess, could be evil where, um, but it could also be a force for good. Yeah, um, my, my thoughts are similar to Emily's um, uh, in that I, I thought, um, but maybe even a little more um, extreme, my reaction to it was that I thought, um, that the the passions actually were quite successful in the end um uh like you said ben and um i'm sorry i forgot the other gentleman's name um the new boyfriends were were actually the, they're more passionate relationships and it, it, jimmy in particular um they talk about um jillian as almost being performative and not actually passionate but more performative in that relationship doing what he wanted and when she actually um and one of the things that scared her about ben was was her passion and her feelings towards him and so i think my message from it was actually when they followed their real passions instead of the destiny that they thought they were supposed to follow that's when they were successful and when things started to to fall in line but when they were doing uh um when they were sort of acting out of spite or out of um requirement that's that's when things went off the rails it was like they were fighting who they were awesome all right number four 
is free will in Hoffman's world subservient to destiny? So I think this is a really interesting question. It was so explored in the rules of magic and I just couldn't help thinking about, you know, this and free will and, you know, all kind of like the biblical undertones of, of that. So I'm excited to hear your thoughts. Erica, what's your take? Um, I think, uh, I, I thought about it in reading practical magic a little bit. Um, but actually today, as I was reading rules of magic, um, there was a quote that I thought kind of pretty much summed up, uh, how I felt about, you know, fate in this world. Um, somebody says something to Jet, um, about, um, something happening. He says it's fate. And she says, we make our own fate. Um, um, and then all at once she realized that they did. They could not control it, but they could choose how to respond to what happened. Um, and I think that's like a lot like, you know, what we see now, like we don't get to control what happens to us, but we can control how we respond to it, which that is our choice. Um, and so that's how I see um, the world working in terms of free will um, in these books. Um, I thought this was a huge theme in Rules of Magic. It was a little bit harder for me to pick up on it in Practical Magic. Um, I think in Rules of Magic, it's a little bit more literal, um, whereas Practical Magic, it's kind of um, like the quote that, that Erica just read. It's controlling how you react to it um, versus trying to control what happens or what is going to happen. Um, so I, since I've only read this one, you know, I'm going to go from what I, I think in this text, it, it seems like, yes, it's definitely subservient. Um, cause when you take into consideration like Jillian and she thinks she can take control and run away and her answer, like, it's not going to ever work for you. Um, and not until she comes back to her family away from being alone, um, like it doesn't necessarily have to be that house, but it has to be with her family and around the people who have like poured their lives into her and been around her and have like a shared history with her. Um, then she can have her destiny. But when she like tries to go and take her own control over things, um, or Sally who doesn't believe in like the mystical things and she just thinks everything's like in her control. Um, and then it's not. And so, um, you know, right, like she ignores the, the death bug, whatever it's called, the, um, the death beetle. And because she's like, I'm going to control it. So I feel like in this book that um, destiny has more of a power, like Ben says, like, you're my destiny. Um, you know, I think that that's really um, what this text says. I agree about that, that this book has a lot of, the destiny is more, plays more of a part. Um, I think that there are things, and I think the example I would have gone to was also the death beetle thing that she tried to, she tried so hard to make that not be true. Um, and it was still uh, destined to be that way. Um, and, but there are, things that they do to be able to sort of like change the course of some things like that um you know sally does come out of her depression and you know is you know, makes the choices that she does to get on with her life and uh, like jillian says when she gets married at the end like fourth time's the charm you know, like she's gonna like keep trying <laughs> and she's finally found somebody to actually connect with. Um, so I think that there are like moments of that free will um, and they are able to maybe like play with destiny, but I think that it sort of focuses or has like the overarching feeling that there is a destiny out there for everybody. Um, yeah, I, um, I thought I said yes or no to this. I, I thought um, like everyone else, I thought there was a really, 
um, dominant theme of, of um, destiny having a, um, a, a stronger hand. But there's that, also that theme um, or, that I found really evocative of the youngest daughter um, when she escapes her rapist in the um, in the forest when she runs to the to the restaurant to meet her sister and she's running and and the thoughts in her head about um that she um that she realizes that that um how she uh whether she can outrun him or not um will determine the outcome of the story and that 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 narrative through her head is the thing that drives her to to actually get away from him and i thought that scene was um unusual, uh, but it, it perhaps a little bit of a, a, a statement for the opposite sentiment that, that, um, that her motivation to um, save herself in that moment was actually what got her through. Because um, as a woman listening to that, uh, it certainly sounds like she's doomed <laughs> from the beginning, but she, she's not because she decides she's not going to be. And so I thought that scene sort of presented the opposite point of view, which I thought was um, an interesting moment in the story. Awesome. Number five is my favorite question. So I'm excited to answer this one. Um, so Alice Hoffman views witches as feminist icons. That's why she's chosen to write about them twice in 20 years. And she said this in an interview, which I found just so compelling. When I was doing the research about what had happened during the Salem witch trials, it was very interesting that so many women who were arrested, who were persecuted, were either single or they owned real estate. They were independent mostly. They weren't poor. They were women who kind of lived on their own, but they lived on the fringes. Witches appeal, still appeal to little girls who dress up for Halloween. There's something about that power that witches have, the power and also kind of the knowledge and the storytelling. And I think what a witch is has really been twisted, which is really we're healers throughout time. So the question is, in both Practical Magic and the Rules of Magic, Alice Hoffman leans into an outsider's narrative. Is the community in the novel reminiscent of attitudes toward irreverent women earlier in our history? What's your perspective on how independent women are viewed today? So um, I just have kind of a bookish experience to share where I really started to think about this this month. Um, so I read along with the Reese Witherspoon Book Club, and I'm sure a lot of you guys do too. I love Reese, but um, this month her book club selection was about how to share shared work with your spouse. And it was just one of those moments where I was like, hey, this is not for me, you know? And it was kind of that outsider, like, oh, I don't fit into the box type moment. Um, totally fine. Obviously, I have many book clubs to read along with and didn't get to, you know, my own book this month. So totally did not keep me up at night. But it was just one of those moments that gave me pause. And I thought that that was really resonant with um, our selection this month. So Miss Erica, what are your thoughts? Um, I think in terms of um, like, first, uh, the idea of like, which is as finished icons. I think you see that a lot more in the rules of magic than you do in practical magic. Um, in practical magic, it was more of like, um, or at least the sense that I got was more like, oh, these are these old ladies that are like, don't take care of their house. Like it could just be, um, you know, the scary house on the block type thing. Um, I didn't notice the, um, I mean, the kid, the girls were like teased in school and stuff. So there was that bit, um, but I didn't notice it um, as being like outsider as much. And like the, the idea of uh, like these women as like powerful, um, like not okay with just, you know, living into traditional roles when that's not what they want to do. Um, but I did see it more in the rules of magic. Um, and I haven't finished that, like I said, but um, that, like you see a lot of the like, uh, you're a witch, so you must be evil, and we need to like, um, you know, keep away, or you know, you'll taint us, or whatever. Um, I I got that more from that than I did practical magic. Um, 
and I'm, I mean, I definitely see how it's, <clears throat> sorry, um, <clears throat> uh, there's this attitude of if you don't fall into these traditional roles, um, then there's a lot of places where you're not going to fit in. Um, and uh, I, it didn't seem like as major of a theme um, as some of the other ones, but it was definitely <clears throat> there. Um, and I did notice it. Um, but like I said, I see it more in roles of magic than in practical magic. So exactly what she said, I was exactly the same way where you saw it a lot more in the rules of magic. Um, and I think now, like if you have these ladies that are strong and independent, um, back then, back when the rules of magic was written, you know, in that time period, um, women were such in the background and they weren't these strong women who had their own houses and things like that. And so I could see the outsider narrative at that point, but with practical magic, it was just, you know, I didn't see it as much. Um, but, you know, being written, if that was written now and someone saw independent women that were doing these things or whatever, I think they they would be kind of like icons, like people to look at, because nowadays it's every woman that is for her own doing things that she wants to do. And, um, you know, the harder the hustle that a woman is doing, like the more she stands out and women want to be like them. So uh, I think that's kind of where the, where like girls still want to be witches or sort of the same thing where they want to have all the knowledge and power and, and do all these things. And it's just like women that little girls see if they're strong and independent, they want to mimic that as well. Um, at this point, both books are running together for me, but um, <laughs> I um, also found that it was more of a thing in rules of magic um, than practical magic. Um, and I think it's kind of like um, in today's, I don't know. And today, <laughs> there um, is this like an independent woman. Is she a threat and an outlier, or is she a hero who is viewed as you know strong and independent, and she can handle her own and, and that sort of thing? Um, and in a way, I can relate to that because. Um, like Lisa Marie was saying, in her experience and not fitting into a box, um, I am 28 years old and all of my friends, <clears throat> excuse me, are also married, but they've got kids and maybe multiple. And I've just got two dogs and my husband. And there are certain things that I'm like, well, I can relate to. Like my, my dogs are like kids, right? Like <laughs> I can stuff with you guys. Um, but obviously it's it's not 100 percent the same so um some people view that as you know good for you guys you guys are doing great you know get your head straight and do what you want to do before you bring a kid into the world and blah blah and then other people are like why why don't you have kids why aren't you having your third already you're 20 29 years old and so it's goes back to the threat or outlier versus a hero. I'm going to glean on to a completely different part of this question. Um, I think it's interesting that she starts with the Salem Witch Trials comparison because um, not just women, there's only 20 people who were actually um, either hanged or pressed out of um, like the hundred and 40 to 150 arrested, 200 and plus accused. So I really think it's interesting um, that she makes it as a solely feminist comparison. Yes, there were more women than men accused and many of those women were did fit that description, but there were many men accused for the very same reasons. Um, they owned property adjacent to, you know, um, the people who were the accusers who were in good favor who attended church and never missed and so um 
it was like a lot of property wars and stuff. And so it wasn't just the women who owned property, it was people who owned property that other people wanted. And this is, you know, before we had like real property deeds and stuff and a government where, who kept those things. So I think it's interesting that she gleaned onto that as particularly feminist, um, you know, um, it, it didn't, women were an easier target at that time for the, those reasons um, as they were in most societies because, you know, having a husband or a father to protect you gave like some legal clout. Um, as far as within the text, I think that the ants are perceived as outliers within their historical town. But once the women leave there, um, they're not so much outliers other than when Jillian first arrives. And, um, you know, but that's not so much of her like witchiness, right? Her mystical sense, but it's just that she's kind of like a wild woman. Um, she's, she's independent, wild. She's beautiful. She's a little bit sexy. You know, the teenage boys like her. Everyone wants to stare at her. She's different, but I don't think necessarily in a way that they see as dangerous, but just as anything that's different, people are kind of interested in, especially in like a kind of sleepier town. And so I think that um, they're outliers, but not necessarily in a negative connotation um, with those two generations. I feel like it does rest more with the ants in their hometown. And I think that's probably why those of you who read Rules of Magic have more comparison to talk about. Um, yes, I agree. Um, I don't think the women were necessarily shunned in the um, text from my interpretation. I know when they were kids, they kind of had to um, deal with a little bit of bullying, but I think that's just more of um, kids just being kids and mean and horrible. Um, so I like yeah they were different, but I felt like people were a little bit more fascinated um, by them rather than like completely creeped out um but they were different and uh, definitely these days now today the independent woman is um celebrated um for sure and if you were um to have these witches um here now like in present day for this story to happen it wouldn't um i don't think it would be too odd and i would be um I think it would be the same thing, just a little bit of fascination, like, oh, okay, they seem cool. So yeah, that's what I, that's what I got from it. I also thought it was uh, interesting that Alice Hoffman made that comparison, like, so directly to the Salem witches. I mean, I get where that comes from, but it was, it's such a, like, leap to, say that the way that the Owens women in these stories are treated by the other people around them to say that that is like comparable to being burned at the stake. I mean, it's, there's no threat of that anywhere in either of these <laughs> books. Um, so that just, I mean, I guess it's like, I don't know, progress or something, but it just seemed more like what the, um, social commentary or something about the way that they were treated by the people in the town it's like people are like whispering about them or you know leaving them out of things or like telling their kids not to go near their house things like that um and i feel like like that kind of speaks more to the human nature of wanting to belong somewhere and that a really easy and like elementary way of belonging to one group is to point out all the ways that you're different from somebody else, like another group. And so like, they were like, oh, they dress weird, or house smells funny, stay away from them. Like, it's just like funny things that about them that was are easy to point to and make them like the outcasts in their community. Um, that I think is just kind of a simple thing to do that people do and maybe even do it unconsciously, but and I don't think that they necessarily like felt it as strongly as they could have. I don't really know where this is going, but it just, it seemed like that drawing the line from the 
like Salem witch trials all the way through how they were being treated by their community today seemed like too much of a leap. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I thought, I actually thought the book kind of um, um, pointed out that, that, that change over time that you were speaking of, Emily, that, um, that the older ants are probably the most ostracized of the, of the Owens women. And then as, as they go down through the family, the younger daughters are, are um, or at least the oldest of the younger generation, um, she's actually quite popular, and um, and so I, I, I think there is sort of um, a, a, a thread wet, webbed through the story that that points out that um, they are um, fitting in better. Um, but with that, there also does seem to be a little more conformity that they seem to be more um, fitting into a social norm as well. So uh, they're while they're accepted, they're also um, like both uh, the oldest daughter has um, uh, a fairly successful romantic relationship at the end, and the younger daughter has her has um, re uh, repaired her relationship with her um, best friend, and and the, both the um, the the two um, Sally and um, Jillian are also sort of resolving those relationships with with men. Uh, it's the aunts, though, who still remain the outliers. Um, so in the book, I think it actually does sort of show an acceptance and a change and a shift in, in the world. Um, in real life, I think, um, I think similar to what um, Desiree said, that on the surface, I think there's, there's often like a, um, um, a heroic like perception of independent women. But I do think there's still an undercurrent, and uh, particularly past a certain age, like as a woman who, who's single at middle age, I find that there's often really subtle signs that 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 um, women my own age who are married are are uncomfortable um, with with the idea of um, independence and they 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 aren't it's not overt and they, it's always sort of um, they it's like uh, there's almost a over um, uh, congratulatory nature when they're talking about um, uh, my my singleness, but there's also sort of an undercurrent of um, it, it's uh, not, it seems oddly, odd or otherly to them. All right, so the next two questions, we're going to wrap up somewhat on time this month. So the next two questions are choose your own adventure. And number six, we've kind of discussed um, all throughout the chat. So it's if you read the prequel, The Rules of Magic, did that change your opinion of practical magic? What did you think of each? Did you prefer one over the other? And then the second question is, if you read A Discovery of Witches with us, or if you've read it just in general, um, what did you think of how Discovery of Witches compared to practical magic? What I thought was really interesting is as I was reading The Rules of Magic, Excuse me, I'm trying not to get a cold, so my throat's a little scratchy. Um, so in The Rules of Magic, Alice Hoffman mentions the a real historical book called A Discovery of Witches. And I had no idea that was a true book that was that was circulating around that same time period. And then she talks about um, The Book of Shadows, which is the sequel to A Discovery of Witches. And I didn't know that was like the old school name for a spell book. And I thought that was just a really cool tie-in. And if you're looking for a very glamour very atmospheric, just an incredible series, I can't recommend Deborah Harkness as Discovery of Witches highly enough. I think all of us reviewed it really highly and just really enjoyed it. It's something I absolutely want to revisit since 2016. She's released two more books in the series, so now there's five. And oh, I... It, I'm always a little tempted to put her back on the reading list because I, I just want to make sure I go back to it. So anyways, uh, let's see, Miss Erica, choose your own adventure. Okay, um, since I've talked a little bit about reading the two books, um, I'll talk about it in relation to A Discovery of Witches, which um, I liked, but it was just sort of a middle of the road read for me. Um, I didn't love it. I did go on and listen to the second book but I haven't finished the series um but I think 
this is more in like the realm of what I enjoy because it's more magic realism than it is like fantasy. Um, and a lot of times like I enjoy certain fantasy type stories, but if the like, if I have to, if I feel like I'm having to learn too much about like, like magic system or the history of all of these people and how it is affecting what's going on now, like I get lost and I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. Um, so like a story like this, where it's just like, this is who they are and it kind of weaves its way in there, but it's not really about the magic. It's more about, um, the family relationships and stuff like that. Um, that's more in like the realm of stuff that I tend to read and enjoy more. Um, so I enjoy this more than a discovery of witches in that series. Um, but only because, um, it's, it closer aligns with, um, my reading in general. So I didn't read the discovery of witches. Um, so I'll just talk about the two, but the rules of magic, I really liked how the women you have Franny and Jet who are really getting, getting into like the powers and the things that they can do. And you have Franny going to the library and finding basically the origin stories of kind of where their family started and why they have this curse and whatnot. Um, and I was so invested in these characters, you know, because they were just so incredible, like all the different things they had to go through for love and the, the loss and, and falling in love and things like that. Whereas the time you get to practical magic, you have, you know, the two, the two older sisters and they're kind of, I think they learn a little bit at the beginning, but then they just want to be like other people. And then you have, um, the other set of younger daughters and they're not really practicing magic. So there's practically no magic left kind of by the time you get to this book. Um, so definitely the rules of magic. I just, everything about it, like it, I just loved it. Um, I read a discovery of witches. I don't remember a whole lot of it, but I remember feeling um, the same way Erica did when I um, read this question. Um, definitely the discovery of witches had way more fantasy, um, and I preferred, um, rules of magic over, well, you know, th that's my top out of those three. Um, rules of magic, I just felt there was more character development, and I loved learning about their backgrounds, and, um, the storyline and like Leslie mentioned the magic and I was really excited to read practical magic because I thought it would kind of just like pick up right where rules of magic left off and that was not the case at all it was like so far into the future and then it was like a few generations down and the ants weren't they were kind of like grazed over but I was like I love them why don't you talk about them more <laughs> like why do they not have you know, a whole lot in this story. Um, so I definitely prefer rules of magic over practical magic and over a discovery of witches. Um, I really like a discovery of witches. That, that's kind of like my thing. Um, I think it's just a little bit more, well, it's, it's bigger, so there's, it's a little more complex. I think that comparatively, um, the similarities between this book and that book or that series um, is like you have her two aunts and they haven't, you know, really, um, they don't really want her doing magic. So that's like a little bit of difference. So she's kind of raised like the younger generation is like, kind of without magic, like she knows it exists. She's not really in that world, though she's kind of adjacent to it. She studies like the practicality of like its history and stuff like that, but in a very like academic sense. And so you have, and it's, you know, um, she comes from the basic same region, region of the world. And so there's those similarities and that's where it ends. Um, as far as the parallel. Um, but I like a discovery, which is, um, it's not like 
it, it's urban fantasy, so it's not like this whole new fantasy world, but you know, like you have your vampires and your witches and there's like tensions of these mystical beings and that kind of going on. And there's definitely some suspension of disbelief and time travel. And, um, but then there's enough of the story that just seems like daily life too, especially in the second book. There's a lot more like daily life practicality going on. Um, than there is in the first book and I haven't got to the third or the subsequent new like second trilogy within the world so um but that's you know I, I definitely recommend it for people who like that style of novel okay so I haven't read rules of magic and I've not read um uh, discovery of witches. Um, reading about witches is not uh, my jam. I'm just going to be completely uh, honest. I've read, um, I've read two books about witches by Shay Earnshaw, and one is um, called um, The Wicked Deep, and then she has a second one coming out this year called Winterwood, and it's similar to. Um, practical magic um in the sense that these um the theme of witches being shunned well i guess that's not the theme of practical magic but i guess what um alice hoffman wanted to portray is like these women witches being shunned um so that was um so those two books by her i would um recommend it's not really a lot of magic it's just like witches um, living in the real world. And I will say that I did watch the American Horror Story uh, season with the witches, and I really enjoyed that. But overall, witches, reading um, about witches is not really my thing. I, um, said, like I said before, I liked rules of magic loved rules of magic um and i also read discovery of witches and loved that as well i only read the first one and this has just reminded me that as we're sitting here i just requested the second one from the library because i meant to read it and <laughs> now it's the perfect time of year um, i loved the approach to witchiness that discovery of witches took um and i also felt like that was more of the like type of witches and spells and magic type things that was evident in rules of magic more than practical magic um and i liked the i thought it was much more fast paced to read even though it was like a much longer book than um practical magic um it was just one i just couldn't stop reading so i'm really excited to keep reading that series So uh, I have not read Rules of Magic. Uh, I did read A Discovery of Witches, but not any of the subsequent books. And um, I liked, I think, both equally. Um, and basically what everyone else has said, um, I think Rules of Magic, or not Rules of Magic, Practical Magic was maybe a little more uh, pedestrian. Um, it just felt a little more um, uh, relatable. And then, um, uh, Discovery of Witches kind of felt a little more gothic and epic and um, um, a little bigger than life, but I liked them both equally, just in different ways. All right, that is a wrap on October's edition of Book Club. So, to looking to the future, in November, we are reading November 9th by Colleen Hoover. This was actually a member submitted pick if from a few years ago when it came out. I've never read Colleen Hoover and she's kind of been on my radar for many years. So I'm really excited. I know she's just has a huge following. I know people have like Colleen Hoover inspired tattoos from her various books and I just can't wait to see what all the hype is about. I just feel like I'm super ready to join this Colleen Hoover party. And this book takes place on a day in LA, I believe. And I mean, it's called November 9th. It was practically made for the Paper and Glam Book Club with all its seasonal glory. So we will be discussing the November selection on the 21st. So just before we trade desktop for stovetop, um, before the Thanksgiving holiday. And also, of course, our 2020 reading list is coming out. It will be 
Um, one of the first Sundays in November, I want to get my hands on all the product before I announce an official date, uh, a lesson learned. <laughs> um, I, I printed the date, I think it was 2016, in the seasonal living list. And then we had like a big fiasco with all the book club planner kits. So <laughs> until the product's in my hands, I've learned to kind of keep the dates tentative. But it is coming in the beginning of November and we can start looking forward to uh, a new year in books and also get everyone the um, 2020 planner kits. So with that, thank you so much for reading along with us and giving us a Thursday. It's been so fun reading all the comments and of course chatting to books with you. So until November, happy Halloween sisters.